Hello and welcome to the, another episode of the Silk and Steel podcast. And today we're going to do a reaction video to John Oliver's segment on Taiwan. And to I, so I have a very special guest to, to help me, uh, the Taiwanese communist rapper Xiang Yu. Welcome to the show, Xiang Yu. Hello. And um, because some people on Twitter have said that I am fake Taiwanese or whatever, here's my qualifications. You see that? Is it in focus? This is my uh, ID. A little bit. But I can make out the flag. Okay. And your your name in Chinese. Oh, whatever. And um, <laughs> this. Yes. <laughs> the passport. The Taiwan passport. Okay. <laughs> All right. You're legit. Now let's uh let's let's get the show started. Ready? Yeah. So are we just going to go in? Do you want to give a introduction to the? Oh uh, sure, um, because a lot of people have commented on social media about the recent John Oliver segment on Taiwan. I watched it. I was impressed. <laughs> I thought it would be a good opportunity to do a react video, um, I, and I thought it would be good to to have you react to the video because your Taiwanese background. So it was brought to my attention that um, so John Oliver obviously didn't compile the information himself. He had um people do it for him, and I'm just looking it up on my um on my phone. It's a very typical list of these like um like liberal China watchers who say they're leftists but never really deviate from um the U.S. State Department's positions. So there is this Lev Nachman, and then he says um, and then there is this Maria NCW, and then he shouts out. James Two Tree, Jessica Zhuang, and um Brian Cho. Uh, Jessica Zhuang works for the uh, uh, uh neocom think tank. Um, what what is it? The project uh, twenty twenty forty nine or something like that. Um, and and uh, James uh, Two Tree. That's James Lin, who is another think tanker who's a. Uh, whose study was actually funded by the government of Taiwan. So, <laughs> And know. then um, our, our um, good friend, Brian Hyo, mm -hmm. um, he used to work at the, um, what is it, the Taiwan um, like Democracy for, um, Foundation for Democracy, something like that. It's, um, it's very um, NED adjacent, um, the National Endowment for Democracy, and it's donated money to um, victims of communism. He doesn't, I don't think he works there anymore, but I mean, that's part of his background. And then there's this K, I don't know, K H A R I S Borloff, K Harris Harris Borloff. Sorry if I'm, as much as I probably don't like you, I'm still sorry for butchering your name. Do you know? Does that look familiar? Sound familiar? Um, I I mean I I block a lot of these people, so I probably... <laughs> there's um dear Clarissa. Oh, is that Clarissa Way? She's a food, uh, isn't she? She's a food writer, food critic. She she made a big uh, deal about how Taiwanese food is different from the Chinese food. I think. Oh, the the the, the black vinegar. <laughs> yes. And yeah. then there's also William William Yang, one twenty. He was from um, I think uh, maybe DW, but you know one of one of those government organized organized medias. So I mean, very similar backgrounds. It's kind of like their think tank yeah. neocon sort of background. They might have um, they they might um, give themselves this sort of like woke um, pseudo progressive garb, but at the end of the day, they serve um, U.S. imperialist interests. These these are these are just just shills. Well, you know, we, we we shouldn't even give them a platform. Let, let's just let's okay. just uh, focus on John Oliver piece because that's what the the public face what the most people see to this. Yeah, but I mean, it's like when I was watching it, I'm like, wow, this guy sounds very familiar. And then I yes. get that information. I'm like, okay, this all makes sense. Okay, start. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's do this. Our main story tonight concerns Taiwan. And it's honestly remarkable that we haven't talked about Taiwan before on this show, given it's the birthplace of bubble tea, which is delicious, even though tapioca ball sounds like a sex move for people over 70. <laughs> and especially since Taiwan shares our unhealthy obsession with mascots. Cities there make tons of them. There is this one, the Milkfish Kids, celebrating one area's milkfish production. And there is this one from a region that produces bananas, which I do not want to talk about right now. <laughs> in fact, Taiwan makes so many mascots that in some cities, the very act of storing them has become a problem. 
We went with the city councilor to a Taipei public school, following her into the depths of a basement parking lot. Here, behind a door, we discovered a mountain of abandoned mascots. This is Sacred Fire Baby from 2013 National Games held in Taipei. The city government should really think about whether it's necessary to keep creating one-off mascots. Oh, come on, Taiwan. You can't just keep making mascots and throwing them away. Thankfully, at the end of our seasons, our mascots go to live on a beautiful farm. A fantastic green farm where Jeff the diseased lung can breathe fresh air and the polar bear with a broken penis can get the care he so badly needs. <laughs> I keep asking my producer where this farm is and she keeps telling me, I'll tell you when you're older. I can't wait! <laughs> But obviously, the major reason that Taiwan... Okay, f f f f stop for a second. So, uh, I, I mean, <laughs> I thought John Oliver is a comedy show, right? I, I'm, I'm expecting some funny moments, but I, I, I don't know. I, so far, it's, uh, I don't find it very funny. I mean, maybe it's a little bit funny for people who watch the show about the in-joke about their own mascot, but the whole idea of presenting that segment is to present Taiwan as this kind of cute, quirky type of place. But if they're going to bring out the joke about the, 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 the polar bear with a broken penis into, into the segment, you know, I'm very disappointed they didn't even show the Taiwan for uh, the pig fertility statue. <laughs> There's a famous pig population statue in Taiwan. I mean, that to, to get... At least that would be funny. That that's actually funny. But anyway, uh, it's um. Oh. He's very. He comes off as very patronizing already. He's like, "Come on, Taiwan." It's like, come. That's. I mean. Yeah, like uh, the 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 crack about the the milk tea and the the the, the mask. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. ends up in the news these days is because of its relationship with China, which, to put it mildly, is fraught. And recently, it's getting even fraughter. China has long viewed Taiwan as its own national territory. China's President Xi Jinping on Saturday all but declaring a policy. The complete reunification of our country must be and will be realized, he said. Military tensions between the two sides are soaring. China's Air Force sent nearly 150 planes into Taiwan's air defense zone since the start of this month. Yeah, okay, stop right there. Stop. Can we go back to the, uh, the, the, the scream we're actually... They actually show the map of the of the air defense uh, Taiwan air defense zone and uh, and the Chinese plane fly over it because um, I'm actually surprised they showed this. They they so they they actually showed the map of the so-called Taiwan ADIZ ADIZ the air defense identification zone, which you can see is pretty ridiculous. Half of which is over the Chinese mainland. And they actually show the fly path. The, that, that's the pink arrow. That's the actual uh, PLA aircraft fly path. You can see it's way in the corner, very far away from the Taiwan island itself. Uh, and, and it's still closer to the mainland Chinese coast. But, but they, they have to... Inf but on that accurate information, that of course, overlay it with all these you know, stacks of airplanes, which then John Oliver makes a joke about, say, oh, you know, not, not, actually not a, not happened as, as it is. But, but again, he was still delivering kind of the mainstream nar narrative on Taiwan, say, oh, look at all these aggressive Chinese maneuver on Taiwan and totally ignoring the fact that I have talked about on, on our show, Silk and Steel, this wasn't even a message to Taiwan or, or the government on Taiwan. This was a reaction to the U.S. Uh, a huge uh, uh, a U.S. armada that was sailing from Okinawa through the, the channel between Taiwan and the Philippines, the Bashi Channel, into South China Sea just prior to that. And, and this happens every time. When well, China sends its PLA uh, flights, cross this ridiculous ADIA zone in the corner every time the U.S. stage a large-scale military exercise in South China Sea and send its, uh, send its uh, multiple aircraft carrier strike group through the Bashi Channel to, uh, into South China Sea. So again, you know, they, they, are, they are, this is... Under international law, there is, um, Taiwan is a part of China. Now, I mean, um, the, 
the um, government in Beijing doesn't effectively administer Taiwan, and that's a reality that it recognizes, just like the government on Taiwan recognizes that it doesn't administer the mainland. Now, the, um, the DPP and also the under international law, the the PLA flight path was over international airspace. You know, even if Taiwan is a country which is not, it has no claim over that airspace, and 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 this is basically the PLA equivalent of doing flight uh, freedom of flight navigation, <laughs> which you know what U.S. is claiming it's doing, uh, you know, by sailing its warship around South China Sea, and and actually they're doing it intentionally very far from the island of Taiwan itself. So people actually living in Taiwan wouldn't even know there was a PLA fly over the ADIA zone. Well, they would because um the the um the Air Force in Taiwan would have a response and then they'll hear the planes taking off, but that's that's different. But the other thing is the ADIZ is not was not drawn up was drawn up by the US during um the around the Korean War. And if you look yeah, at a in map, it's fifty-three, I believe. Yeah, it's yeah. connected with the ADIZs of South Korea and Japan. It's clearly there to serve um, U.S. interests. And um, ADIZ is not um, is not um, sovereign airspace. It, it has no internet. It has no basis in, under international law. It's a, a United States is the first nation that started drawing ADIA zone. It just says, "Hey, anybody who fly into these zones, you have to identify yourself." And uh, you know, there's no. It's the the intention of ADIA zone is actually to draw it over international airspace. So supposedly you have a warning before the flight comes into your own airspace, right? So so again, you know, China PRC did not fly anywhere near the so-called Taiwan airspace. It's international airspace. It didn't fly over the island. There weren't exactly. planes in like Taipei or like Taizong, Kaohsiung, Tainan or any anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, they did. I mean, not exactly like that, I presume, in a big stack. I'm guessing they flew the planes out one at a time, not heaped on top of each other like an air traffic controller's nightmare. <laughs> the point is, China insists that Taiwan an independently operating entity with its own democratically elected leaders, armed forces and constitution is actually part of China and in no way a separate country. Here's an understatement. The Chinese government feels strongly about this. So strongly, in fact, that when John Cena went on a press tour for the most recent Fast and Furious movie and said, Taiwan is the first country that can watch F9, this is what happened next. Actor John Cena has apologized to China after... Can I add a comment here? Yes, go ahead. Um, if a country is independent, it needs to um, it needs to be established. There should be a concrete date of its establishment. Now, I mean, there's um, there's reality, and then there's like um, de jure stuff. Now, um, the reason why Taiwan is separately administered from the mainland is because of the um, Chinese Civil War and how um. Chiang Kai-shek's forces, after being defeated on the mainland, all they had left was Taiwan. It wasn't a case of, oh, Chiang Kai-shek relocated, went to this island and then set up a new government. It's more of like, it's the remnant of the old Republic of China. So um, even under, so there no new constitution was drawn up when it relocated, when the central government of um, Chiang Kai-shek's regime relocated to Taiwan. So, and um, it never changed its constitutional map. I mean, it didn't, I mean, it, there are some people who don't understand this and think, oh, so like Taiwan is like still trying to claim all of uh, claim the rest of China and haha, like that's so like that's so ridiculous. Why don't they change their map? So it ref that's actually what the separatists want. Um, and we'll get into that later. Actually, but going back to the segment earlier where they allude to the Xi Jinping speech on Taiwan, uh, I actually watched the Xi Jinping speech uh, and I, I found a clip from The Guardian. So people it cannot accuse me of using CCP sources. The guard with the, even with the Guardian translation, Xi Jinping clearly said, "Peaceful reunification with Taiwan is most in line with wishes of the Chinese people." Like, but that peaceful part got completely left out in any of the Western media mainstream reporting. Instead, you get get titles like. China, Xi Jinping reiterate pledge China will swallow up Taiwan again. You know, so the the um Beijing's pretty like hands off with this. Like for the longest time, 
it's kind of okay with the reality that Taiwan is separately governed and that there um there is the a government that calls itself the Republic of China that's still on Taiwan now the now Beijing doesn't recognize the sovereignty of the on um, the so-called ROC as a separate country but it recognizes it as a governing entity that's why um I mean, it, it won't refer to um, Tsai Ing-wen as the president. It will refer to her as the leader of the Taiwan area. And it won't call the government the Republic of China, but rather the like the, the administration of the Taiwan area. And um, it's always been that as long as you don't declare independence and move closer to the U.S., we can kind of just let this go on indefinitely until until one day the conditions are right and we can sit down and talk about conditions for reunification and until around 2000 i mean he mentions later in this episode that uh, most people want to maintain the status quo but what's um i mean in recent decades for a number of reasons that we can talk about later um a lot of the youth are kind of maintain the status quo with the hopes of moving towards independence somewhere in the future in the distant future indefinitely but just maintain the status quo for as long as possible but in um at around the turn of the century, most people's most people want to maintain the status quo and eventually reunify. So I mean, things did happen, and it's not just oh China doing this, 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 like Beijing doing this against the Taipei regime. It wasn't just that; it was also a the result of um decades of social engineering and um changes in education, media, and culture done in a very top down fashion. I must add that changed the um the way. The people in Taiwan today view the, the majority of the youth view themselves. Yeah, and people talk when people think about talking about social engineers, they immediately associate it with mainland China, the CCP, right? They don't realize that that's actually done in other places too. I mean, it's particularly in Taiwan. Um, and and this he's gonna he's gonna talk about it later about how most of the government actually don't recognize Taiwan, but he. Before he did that, he prefaces like how so ridiculous that, uh, you know, uh, China wouldn't allow other people address Taiwan as a country. But John Oliver, he's a British American, you know, neither UK nor United States recognize Taiwan as an independent country. So and when they did have relations with the Taipei government, it did not recognize Taiwan as a country either. They recognized the, the so-called Republic of China as a legitimate government of all of China. Exactly. Yeah. Also, another th- another thing I want to add is um, this one person I saw on Twitter said, um, it's all land back and autonomy for people until China is involved. Taiwan is its own country and its people want their independence. And then like it t- talks about, and then like there's people talking about like, like indigenous people, this, that. It's like, okay, you realize there are indigenous people in Taiwan, but you realize that um, the, the percentage of Han people in Taiwan is higher than the percentage of, percentage of Han people on the Chinese mainland. And the separatist movement you see today is a very Han-centric movement. Yeah, there's only there's only 2% of the uh, population in Taiwan is indigenous today. And and the, the, the This fact has nothing that... to do with indigenous rights. Like Taiwan exactly. separatism has nothing to do with indigenous rights. Let me yeah. reiterate that. It has nothing yeah. to do with it whatsoever. It, it, the indigenous people is not the that majority that's cl- clamoring for independence. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so okay, let's let's keep going with this. We call Taiwan a country. <laughs> Every part of that is so weird. It's weird John Cena apologized to China. It's weird he did it for calling Taiwan a country. And it's weird to see him do it in pretty decent Mandarin. (laughs) That's just too many weird things. I half expected that shot to pan out to reveal he's also doing a needlepoint of Liam Neeson kissing an ostrich. Honestly, it would only make it slightly... Stop. So, he... he, I mean, how is it weird? Why is it weird that John Cena speaks Chinese? Why is it weird that Jiang Cena is apologizing to China for calling Taiwan a country? These are actually very logical uh, things because you know he wants Jiang to Cina, make money in the Chinese market. 
Exactly, exactly. I mean, these. But he's presenting this as some, 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 somewhat odd. I mean, how, how odd is that? You know, they John Cena wants to maintain access to the Chinese market, so he ma- he made an effort to to learn Mandarin Chinese to make his apology, and that uh, you know he actually did a, apparently a good job learning his his Mandarin accent, and he's making John Oliver is making like this is this is not normal. Why? Why is it not normal? <laughs> this is capitalism. And um, let's say I was a um, professional wrestler like John Cena. <laughs> okay, just let's just what if? I know I know it's a very it's a very um funny picture. And um, let's say I had a career and I really wanted to um have a career in South Korea. You think they would let me in there and like have like um all the as much media exposure as John Cena does if I keep on doing what I do now, which is um, always talk, talk about um, how, like, speak kind of in defense of the DPRK. You think they would let that? Or do you think I would have to go on TV and say, I'm, I'm sorry for calling your government a puppet regime and um, and that and that the democratic peoples of... I uh, can't say that anymore. I can't call them by the <laughs> net. That um, North Korea is the um, is a legitimate government of all of Korea. You, th- you think... Wouldn't I have to do something similar if I wanted to establish a career in South Korea? That's it's just politics and and just business decisions. Yeah, yeah. The, the, John Oliver just trying to reinforce kind of the the narrative that what U.S. the the U.S. narrative, you know, the the desire narrative on China and Taiwan is a norm. That 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 anything deviate from that is odd and and abnormal. I mean, that's what he's actually doing here. But suspected sympathizers anyway. of the Communist Party under when um, Chiang Kai Shek was in power in Taiwan was um, execution. Yeah. Well, okay. Let's let's keep watching. But John Cena is not alone here. Taiwan is such a third rail for China that it may be why Paramount Pictures removed the Taiwanese flag from Tom Cruise's jacket for the Top Gun sequel. And it is definitely why the Gap apologized for releasing okay, stop, this. T- stop for a second. The Paramount Pictures, the, the Top Gun sequel, is co-financed by Tencent Pictures, a Chinese company. You know. Again, it's just logical capitalism. Your financer is a Chinese company, and they don't want you to put the Taiwan flag on the jacket. And also, you... not to mention, that is not even a Taiwan flag. That that's still a Chinese flag, but it's because the because the government that still calls itself the Republic of China still um exists exactly, in Taiwan. That... Then it's it becomes a problem. That has been the flag of Republic of China since 1927, you know, at least. <laughs> it's it's way before. Um, yeah, yeah. But but again, you know, John, John Oliver is obf- obfuscating the issue. Okay, let's The Gap keep... apologized for releasing this T-shirt featuring a map of China without Taiwan attached. That shirt caused a shitstorm, and it led to The Gap. Makers of the bland T-shirts that dads wear when they're on the elliptical for 30 minutes to apologize to 1.4 billion people. So if China is getting T-shirt retractions from the Gap, loudly vowing to reunify with Taiwan and sending... It's easy. Just don't sell your T-shirt in China. Yeah, I mean, if you want to sell your T-shirt in China, you you have to appeal to your your uh, consumers. I mean, that's just logic of capitalism. I, I don't... I don't I'm surprised John Oliver presents this as some somewhat weird. I mean, of course he understands that, but he has to present this as somewhat weird because it, it, the idea is, is that um, anyone bent to the will of the Chinese consumers rather than, say, American consumer is weird, right? That's what he's really saying here. And sending stacks of warplanes towards it <laughs> in record-breaking numbers. It feels like tonight it'd be worth taking a look at Taiwan how it got to be in the unique position that it's in, what the world wants from it, and most importantly, what it wants for itself. And let's start with how we got here. Historically, Taiwan has been like the Stanley Cup of Asian history in that different people keep passing it around and carving their names on it. (laughs) Here is a ludicrously brief history of the last 400 years there. Notice how he starts it at 400 years. Yep, of course. That alone is very very Han-centric because 400 years is when... um, it's funny because um, 400 years is when um, Chinese migrants began settling on Taiwan. Exactly. It's 400 years ago, the... they're the people who made Taiwan Chinese in the first place. 
and 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 that's why they they i mean like it, it's if they really want to talk about indigenous people in taiwan they they should go back like tens of thousands of years <laughs> but now a thousand yeah yeah but they 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 chose they chose 400 years mark as a very specific reason because that's when the chinese migrants start to migrate to taiwan under the dutch cl- colonial rule but okay let, let's keep going Taiwan, or as it's sometimes been called Formosa, was first home to indigenous people, then colonized by the Dutch and briefly the Spanish before China's Qing dynasty held it for about 200 years. Um, how did the Qing dynasty get there? Yeah, and, and it... Then he makes and, it seem like, oh, the Qing dynasty just randomly one day decided, okay, we're going to take Taiwan. I mean, they 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 skip the the part of the uh, the mean loyalist under Koshinga kicking out the Dutch from Taiwan. Uh, I mean, that's yeah, that's a very important part of the. Just listen to our um our our history of Taiwan series. It's completely unlocked now. On the uh, the link to the playlist is going to be in the in the video description. It should be, I think, part two, part one or part two, probably part one. One of the early episodes. Okay, continue. Then, in 1895, China lost Taiwan to Japan, which turned it into a so-called model colony, imposing Japanese cultural values and generally ruling it with an iron fist. Then, after World War... What, I just w- want to remind people that the Qin established its rule in Taiwan in, in 1682. Uh, and, and if you want to go back further, you know, go to the Koxinga kicking out the Dutch in 1662. So that's... That's all. That's like almost hundred years. That's a hundred years earlier than the establishment of the United States. Uh, you know, of which John Oliver is a citizen. So, so China had its rule on Taiwan a hundred years before. You know, Taiwan was part of China a hundred years before United States was founded. Just keep that in mind. Okay. Then, after World War II, two major things happened. First, the Allies put Taiwan back under Chinese control. And second, the civil war that was taking place in China between the nationalist government, led by Chiang Kai-shek, and the communists, led by Mao Zedong, ended. Now, spoiler alert, the communists won. (laughs) Congratulations to Mao! And in the wake of that defeat, Chiang Kai-shek fled to Taiwan along with two million nationalist soldiers and refugees, basically setting up a Chinese government in exile, meaning that China technically had two governments at the time, one in China and one in Taiwan. And Western... This is very usual in Chinese history when a new, let's say, when, like, a new dynasty takes over, remnants of the old one still exist. Like, when, um, it is said that, um, Qin Shi Huang uh, unified China... But, but, I mean, there were still parts of China that weren't under his control, but we don't, like, you know, like, for example, like, Wei Guo. Yeah, he's, he's saying, he's basically saying Chiang Kai-shek went to Taiwan and took it over and set up the Chinese government in exile. But from, at least from perspective, Chiang Kai-shek, you know, Taiwan is just part of China that's still under his control. Nothing has really changed except... You know, he's got kicked out from mainland China. You know, Taiwan the, the, the... was returned to China in 1945. Chiang Kai-shek relocated the government, like the central government, to Taipei in 1949. But during those four years, t- Taiwan was already under the um, the Republic of China's control. I mean, we y- there's more details in the um in our series, but those were a very um, tumultuous four years, to say the least. And Western countries were very invested in the success of the second one, even calling Taiwan Free China, because they saw it as a necessary bulwark against communism. Against all prophecies, Formosa still keeps the anti-communist flag flying, only 100 miles or so off the mainland of China. It's a prosperous island where the new generations grow up in freedom, a complete contrast to conditions under the rule of Mao Zedong. You know, I do kind of miss that period of human history where the only way to learn about other cultures was to have a British man on amphetamines tell you <laughs> which were the good ones and which were the baddies. Here... Isn't that what we're doing right now? <laughs> <laughs> this is actually the part of the video I found the most hilarious. I mean, that, that's actually legitimately funny. <laughs> Here we see Formosians living in freedom. Well, not freedom per se, but the point is they're not commies, and that's where my curiosity terminates. <laughs> but while... He doesn't really mention how, um, during that time, um, Chiang Kai-shek's goal was to retake the mainland. 
Even and though- also 1959, that's right after the 1958 uh, second Taiwan Strait crisis, where United States government threatened to use nuclear weapon against mainland China for trying to take over the the offshore, not even Taiwan, but just the offshore islands of off the coast of Fujian. We're talking about Kinmen and Mazu, right? That just try, just for they they warned the U.S government warned China if they were trying to take those Chinese islands right a couple miles off the Chinese coast they will use nuclear weapons I mean think about that but then Mao um intentionally left them under Chiang Kai-shek's control because to draw the distance to, to um close the distance between the two and basically have Chiang Kai-shek by the balls Listen to our so uh, our Taiwan history series on Silk and Steel podcast where we cover this in more detail. But while, while Chiang Kai-shek might have been a staunchly anti-communist U.S. ally, historically we've had a lot of those, and they often haven't been great people. And Chiang ruled Taiwan as a brutal authoritarian. Thousands were swept up in a period that came to be known as the White Terror, suffering imprisonment, torture, and even execution. Doing anything that could be remotely construed as criticism of the government was extremely risky, as one writer discovered when he merely translated a Popeye comic strip. Popeye and his son were in exile on an island, and they were campaigning for election there. Popeye gave a speech, and he used an English word, fellows. There could be hundreds of translations for fellows, but I chose one which was all my fellow countrymen. This was terrible. The Bureau of Investigation arrested me, saying, why didn't you translate it into something else? This is exactly the way our President Zhang speaks. You are making fun of him. It deserves the death penalty. No doubt, the death penalty. It's true. That guy was interrogated for months on suspicion of being a communist collaborator and ultimately spent nine years in prison, all because Zhang's government thought a Popeye comic had a hidden political message, which is a bit of a reach. There is clearly no deeper meaning to Popeye comics other than women are inherently prizes to be fought over, performance-enhancing drugs are cool, and (laughs) Bluto doesn't deserve love. All of which is to say... In the middle of the last century, Taiwan was a grim place. But after Chiang died in 1975, under pressure both internationally and from political movements at home, the nationalists began to loosen their grip, ending martial law in the late 80s and opening the door to full democratization. So again... That's... You know what's funny is, I, in my opinion, I don't, I don't know about you, but I think um, if you really want to understand Taiwan today... Um, understanding the Jiang Jingguo era, so from the time Chiang Kai-shek died in 1975 until 1988, is more important than understanding the details of the um, the um, Chiang Kai-shek era in Taiwan. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, Chiang, Kai, Chiang Jingguo laid the foundation for the for for Taiwan of later. I mean, but but TSMC, I guess that was under that was under him. Yeah, and I but I guess uh, you know Jiang Jingguo era would be. Little too too much information and too uh not conducive to the narrative for for John Oliver to include. So that's why he quickly skipped from the death of Zhang Kai Shi in the nineteen seventies to quickly skip over to the end of uh eighties. You know that 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 Zhang Jingguo era just conveniently conveniently ignored. And the democratization movement. I mean, that's yeah. We we cover again. We cover in great detail in the Taiwan history series on Silk and Steel podcast. Go check that out. Against the odds, Taiwan shifted from a dictatorship to a functioning, vibrant democracy. I don't think it was against all odds. If you think about it, look at the time. Um, look at the time when um, South Korea democratized. It um, this stuff. Why didn't the U.S. pressure um, pressure Chiang Kai-shek into becoming more democratic? Well, it kind of half-assed pressured him a little bit, but not quite. But I mean, it's the the, the um. First of all, the global, the, the international arena was changing. The, the socialist bloc was collapsing one country after another. And there was a rising middle class in Taiwan. And um, Chiang Kai-shek and Jiang Jingwo, they were Bonapartist leaders. And Bonapartist leaders, I mean, they were, they, they did kind of serve U.S. imperialism. 
but they were strong men and they had too many ideas of their own and they weren't the um the they weren't too obedient to the US as much as the US wanted them to be so under these circumstances and when um the communist threat has more or less thoroughly been eradicated and there was no risk for Taiwan to um to go against US imperialism and join the socialist bloc during a time when it looked like the entire socialist bloc was just going to collapse a liberal democracy with a weak leader that is more malle- that is seen as more malleable by the U.S. is pre- is preferable over the likes of um, Chiang Kai Shek and Jiang Jingguo. Yeah, and and also I think also another driver for democratization from uh, in Taiwan and and also South Korea is that uh, the, the government there also recognized in order to gain more legitimacy to 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 gar- garner continued U.S. support after the the cold war ended is to gradually adopt more democratic reforms so they can fully pass them as you know democracy so therefore us must support us if you read um jiang jingguo's diaries um it was he had a lot going on in his mind like whether or not to do his political reforms and um one of the quotes from his from his um diary was um if we don't reform then we will be ousted by revolution. It was. It's a. It's a controlled. It's kind of a controlled demolition of, uh, of a uh, authoritarian di- right wing dictatorship. Yep. Prince democracy, and I do mean vibrant. A debate over how billions of euros will be allocated for an infrastructure development plan descended into a brawl in Taiwan's parliament on Tuesday. Members of the ruling Democratic Progressive Party and the opposition Nationalist Party threw water and shoved each other to the floor. Taiwan's MPs are known for brawling and even throwing objects at each other. And fights in Parliament are even seen as one way for the opposition to show voters that it stands tough on issues. Yeah, fighting is not uncommon in Taiwan's Parliament. Here they are throwing water balloons at each other, and here they are hurling pig guts during a debate on pork imports. And that is not all. One time in 2006, a member snatched a written proposal of a bill and shoved it into her own mouth. I love how he doesn't mention how um, the Altier gas Parliament to block um, a U.S. arms U.S. arms deal. Yeah. Or the or it's not convenient for the narrative. Yeah, or the pork deal, the, the pork import deal was about uh, the import from the U the U S the U S pork that's fed on uh, what's that what's that what's that chemical? Um, it starts with an R. I call it laiju. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. And these fights are are not as good as the ones in the nineties. Those were better, anyways. <laughs> Which is fantastic and definitely something that we should steal. You want to kill a clean energy bill? Pull up a chair and fucking eat all 900 pages of it. <laughs> but Taiwan is not just a functioning democracy. It's a major player in the global supply chain. Taiwan was the fastest growing economy in Asia last year and it's the world's key manufacturer of semiconductors which are used absolutely everywhere in products from cars to sex toys. So the next time that you fire up a butt plug that has a hundred thousand times more computing power than the Apollo moon mission, make sure you say, thanks Taiwan. (laughs) So all of this brings us to where we are right now with Taiwan established as a highly developed and wealthy country and yet no one is allowed to call it one. And that brings us back to the huge, unresolved issue of Taiwanese sovereignty. Why doesn't he mention that even um, the constitution in Taiwan doesn't call it a country? It, 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 you, you don't just one day start calling, let's say, the 13 colonies in, um, in North America. You don't just start calling them a country until it's declared independence. And then after it declared independence, it had to, it had to um, fight for its um, recognition. Yeah, there's no most of the most of the country in the world don't recognize Taiwan as a country. The the, the Taiwan the, the constitution on Taiwan don't recognize uh, Taiwan as a country. You know, other than you know Repu- Republic of China. So that that obviously does not fit the narrative that John Oliver is selling here. He talks about it later in this thing with the um with the, what is it the strategic ambiguity. Taiwanese sovereignty because China now sees claiming Taiwan as a key point of national pride with Xi Jinping calling reunification part of his vision for the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation and anyone 
wanting to do business in China knows that calling Taiwan a country is a massive faux pas. And it's not just The Gap and John Cena who have found this out. <laughs> All of these companies have either had to apologize for or walk back even the smallest implication that Taiwan is a separate country. But why would you insist on calling Taiwan a separate country when, you know, none of the major governments like, like, like United States <laughs> do not recognize China's uh, Taiwan as a country. Then why why do you need to insist calling Taiwan a country? I mean, just a good business practice to follow. You know what 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 will sell on the Chinese mainland. I mean, what's what is wrong with that? It is again, he's presenting this as some something weird. It's 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 not. It's actually not weird at all. Declare independence. Establish a new country. Make that let that country gain recognition. Then we'll call it a country. And you can see this caution everywhere. At this year's Olympics, you probably saw Taiwanese athletes competing not under the Taiwanese flag, but under the fake pseudo flag of Chinese Taipei. Some... When the so-called Republic of China participated in the Olympics, mainland Chinese athletes didn't compete in it. Yeah. And the name Chinese Taipei was actually um, agreed upon by um, the KMT. The, um, I think they had the option of competing as um, Taiwan province of China or something like that or just under the name Taiwan, but they didn't want that because they didn't want to imply that Taiwan was a country. So then they called it Chinese Taipei because Taipei is the, um, is the seat of the, um, the administration that governs Taiwan. It wasn't, um, I have, I have a few threads on Twitter describing it, but it's, it, it's kind of, um, the government on Taiwan decided that. And I mean, I mean, nowadays a lot of youth don't like it, but he's kind of just leaving out the background information. One China policy is um, you recognize either the People's Republic of China as the government of all of China or the so-called Republic of China as the government of all of China. So, I mean, I think this arrangement is a lot more fair to both Chinese mainlanders and people on Taiwan than the old arrangement, which was the, the so-called Republic of China represented all of China, but it only had people in Taiwan and then mainlanders did not compete. Right. It's just it's just a compromise. As long as the cross strait issues aren't resolved, you're gonna see these sorts of um, these sorts of compromises that um allow allow Taiwan to participate in these sorts of things, but through little like technicalities. I mean, Beijing puts up with it. Chinese Taipei. Something they've been forced to use at every Olympic since the 1980s when they reached a compromise with the IOC that allowed them to participate without angering China. But this arrangement isn't something that all Taiwanese people appreciate. In fact, during the 2012 Games, the lead singer of Taiwanese heavy metal band, band Thonic pointed out just how ludicrous it is. Our team, our national team being called Chinese fucking Taipei. <laughs> fucking bullshit, right? Oh, we can't call you Taiwan, sorry. We have to call you Chinese fucking Taipei. Here's the thing, why is he, why is he bitching about that to a bunch of foreigners? <laughs> yeah, I was I first I was I found it jarring like why is he using English and I realized he he, he must not be speaking with uh with a, a Taiwan audience in Taiwan. I mean here's the thing like it's um if you want to establish an independent country you don't do it by going around begging a bunch of like Begging a bunch of Westerners, like, what does that do? I mean, imagine if uh, Mao Zedong wanted to establish New China and all he did was, like, go around to, um, go, go around to, like, America and other places and say, man, um, you know, they call us the Republic of fucking China and, um, Chiang Kai-shek is bad and we need to, you need to support, you need to, um, tell them that, no, we are the real China. No, that, that, that's not how politics works. That's not how the real world works. No. <laughs> I know I say this every week, but that death metal singer complaining about Olympic nomenclature has a real point there. <laughs> although, although, to be fair, if their official Olympics name really was Chinese fucking Taipei, <laughs> that would at least be a little more accurate vis-a-vis -vis who is fucking whom. <laughs> and even huge international organizations like the WHO are forced to play this ridiculous game, freezing out Taiwan from full participation. Last year, what do you mean forced to play this ridiculous game? 
you know, none of these other major members of WHO recognize Taiwan as a country. The United States, again, United States don't recognize Taiwan as a country. Why should WHO do anything different? You know, like this is actually part of the Trump administration's initiative to kind of uh, kind of do the creeping recognition of Taiwan as independence. So they, they were really pushing for WHO to to include Taiwan. And, and th- so this is what John Oliver is doing right now is is pushing the same agenda the Trump administration official did uh, a few, starting during the COVID times. From full participation. Last year, when one WHO official was pressed on this point by a Hong Kong newscaster, it led to this very awkward interaction. Will the WHO consider Taiwan's membership? <laughs> Hello? Why would it consider Taiwan's membership un- until it becomes a country? Exactly. Right. I mean, it's you become a country first and then you get admitted. Like, imagine if um, you know how there was a referendum on Scottish independence. Imagine if before that referendum, OK, the situation is different because of the UK actually has um, control, of, actually governs Scotland. But let's just for the sake of simplicity, imagine if um, Scottish um, independence advocates pressed for being allowed to join the WHO as Scotland before they got um before they established their own separate state and became independent. Hello? We, we're the, we're the... I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I couldn't hear your question. Okay, yeah, let me let, let me let me repeat the question. No, so... that's okay. Let, let's move to another one then. Right. Because because I'm I'm actually curious on talking about Taiwan as well, on Taiwan's case. <laughs> We decided to give Dr. Alward another call to follow up. And I just want to see if you can comment a bit on how Taiwan has done so far in terms of containing the virus. Well, we've, we've already talked about China. Oh, we did, did we? This is so embarrassing. I mean, just look at the way that these people just keep on like begging, begging the white man for approval and recognition. It's... It's just very sad. I mean, they they speak about, you know, dignity and respect and all that stuff whenever they talk, whenever they're, um, whenever the um, other party is the Chinese mainland. But then when it's Westerners, it's always just like wagging your tail, begging for scraps, begging, begging to be petted. It's, it's, it's very disgraceful. Are you sure about that? Because it sure seems like first you pretended not to hear the question, then faked getting disconnected after committing the world's most telegraphed log off. Uh, um, so when when Beijing replaced Taipei in the UN, it, Taiwan wasn't kicked out. the the gover- the Chiang Kai Shek's regime was kicked out of the kicked out of the UN. But when the um when the so-called ROC used to be in the UN, it represented all of China. It's that seat that just got passed on to the PRC. So his um the way he responded, while it might anger some, is in line with um the UN's position. That man couldn't be more clearly avoiding the question if he came back online pretending to be a lamp. Uh, you can't ask a lamp about Taiwan, especially me. I only speak French. So that's actually two reasons I shouldn't have to answer this question. I'm a lamp and I only speak French, except for this brief paragraph in English explaining my situation. Au revoir, je suis lamp. <laughs> But it is not just companies and international organizations. The vast majority of world governments have no official diplomatic relations with Taiwan because China won't have diplomatic relations with anyone who does. And for all the initial cheerleading from Western countries about Taiwan's pluck and verve in keeping the anti-communist flag flying, (laughs) things have shifted. Shows you how good of a friend Westerners are. And... Also, just go back to uh, the the WHO thing. So the government of Taiwan was allowed to participate under the designation of Chinese Taipei as an observer from 2009, 2016. So, you know, 
you know, the, there, there was that option to participate as Chinese Taipei. It, um, it was because um the the new um the new government Tsai Ing-wen's government did not want to recognize the um, 1992 consensus that it was no longer observer, right? Yeah, yeah. By the end of the 1970s, most countries had switched their recognition of China's official government from the one on Taiwan, known as the Republic of China, to the communist one on the mainland, the People's Republic of China. In fact, today, the number of governments still willing to diplomatically recognize Taiwan has dwindled to only 14 countries and the Holy See. Although, that last one really shouldn't be that surprising to you. You know the Pope. He loves to stir shit up. <laughs> drinks wine in the morning. He's a messy bitch who lives for drama. <laughs> now, as for America, we've spent the past half century walking a diplomatic tightrope with a I just have to say John Oliver is not very funny. I mean, I've been I we're almost through the whole segment. It, it, it's more than halfway done. It's just there's not that many funny funny parts. This is supposed to be a comedy show. And uh anyway, look at look at who who compiled all of his information. They're just not they're, they're funny to laugh at, but they're not funny people. <laughs> and the, the and I would just want to see the look on people's faces when Vatican finally recognized uh, People's Republic of China. I I would love to see people's reaction to that. Diplomatic tightrope with a policy known as strategic ambiguity. It's something that lets us maintain functional relations with Taiwan and still have a full formal relationship with China. It's an approach that began in the 1970s, and it was built upon a series of incredibly carefully worded statements. The United States, uh, in one of our communiques with the People's Republic of China, acknowledged... Okay, stop right here. Um, in, in this document, which they highlighted here, the U.S. clearly said that U.S. acknowledged all Chinese on either side of the Taiwan Strait maintain there's but one China and Taiwan is part of China. That was actually the position of the uh, of the uh, RO, the Chiang Kai Shek's ROC government and the the, the 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 PRC government that you know there is only one China and and also in this in this document it was very clear it was referring to both sides of the Taiwan Strait as Chinese. So in but when they quoted it, they very cleverly twisted around as saying we reg the US recognized the PRC claim, but conventionally ignored that was also the claim by the government on Taiwan at the time. Can I read out the whole um the whole paragraph that's yes. highlighted? Yes. The US side declared the US the United States acknowledges that all Chinese on either side of the Taiwan Strait maintain there is but one China and that Taiwan is a part of China. And this was true in the 70s, with the, with the exception of like a very, very niche um, minority. The United States government does not challenge that position. It reaffirms its interest in a peaceful settlement of the Taiwan question by the Chinese themselves. With this prospect in mind, it affirms the ultimate objective of the withdrawal of all U.S. forces and military installations from Taiwan. In the meantime, it will progressively reduce its forces and military installations on Taiwan as the tension in the area diminishes. Yeah. And for people who don't know, U.S. used to uh, station nuclear-capable missiles on Taiwan, aiming at China. And, and U.S. Marines uh, stationed on Taiwan until 1972. Hey, if the U.S. really wanted Taiwan to be able to affirm its um, sovereignty, then why did it um wh why did it force Li Donghui to um kill off the nuclear weapons program as soon as Jiang Jingguo died? Yep. The PRC position that Taiwan was part of China, but the United States also did not accept the PRC claim to Taiwan. That has been our position ever since, and so in effect, the U.S. views Taiwan's status as undetermined. Right. We acknowledged China's claim, but didn't agree with it, leaving Taiwan's status as undetermined. You know, like Schrodinger's cat or the Scientology version, Miscavige's wife. They could be one thing or the other thing, and no one knows for sure, do they, David? Hey, David, David, where's Shelley? But that confusion is emblematic of the strategic ambiguity policy. For instance, the US operates out of this building in Taiwan, often referred to as its de facto embassy, but not, crucially, 
as an actual embassy. Taiwan, meanwhile, has this building in D.C., which does pretty much everything that an embassy would do, just without actually being called one. And I know that this policy can occasionally seem ridiculous, but the uncertainty is kind of the point, especially when it comes to defence. In 1979, Congress passed the Taiwan Relations Act, in which the U.S. committed to assist Taiwan in maintaining its... Interesting to note that um, the the Taiwan Relations Act is a unilateral law. It's a domestic law in the U.S. That, and um, Taiwan didn't really play a part in um, in drafting it. Nowhere in the Taiwan Relations Act does um, the U.S. state its obligations to defend Taiwan in the event of a war. It just um, states that efforts to determine Taiwan's status by non peaceful means are matters of grave concern. And matters of matters of grave concern doesn't mean hey. We'll send people out to defend you. It just means we'll be concerned about it. Basically, well, it could it could just mean we're just going to make a stern statement. And um, U.S. lawmakers are very aware of um, this lack of commitment because um, there was a um, former Illinois senator, um, Charles H. Percy, who um, wanted to kind of um, be more committed to defending um, the the Taiwan the, the regime on Taiwan. So he proposed changing the words grave concerns to um, security interest. But, and this is very important, his um, proposal was vetoed because um, it would commit the U.S. to war with um, China should, um, should cross-strait antagonisms between uh, Taiwan and the mainland intensify. And, um, <clears throat> and senior Pentagon official Edward Ross once said, um, as the lone superpower, so he's talking about the U.S., our interests are plentiful and our attention short. We cannot help defend you if you cannot defend yourself. So to all um, naive Taiwanese liberals who think the U.S. is your friend, I, I, and especially if you're, if you're an idiot who works at a um, neocon think tank, you should think again. This Taiwan in maintaining its self-defense capability. But that commitment very much stops short of the U.S. promising to defend Taiwan from a Chinese invasion. Instead, it says... Any effort to determine the future of Taiwan by other than peaceful means would be of grave concern to the United States. And what does that even mean? Does it mean the US would deploy military assets? It means they'll get John Oliver to bitch about it. <laughs> or just that the US general would slightly raise an eyebrow. No one really knows. It is a willfully confusing will they or won't they dance that for 40 years has been the backbone of US Taiwan policy. And look, Actually, the, the real essence uh, in practicality, the essence of Taiwan Relation Act is to allow U.S. to continually sell wet, high price weaponry to Taiwan. Uh, that, that's something that, that Taiwan hasn't really, uh, <laughs> I mean, it, for over the last, I say, 40, 50 years really has a need. But they, they continue to pay the price as a as a protection money to the United States. And those um and those weapons aren't useful enough against the PLA. It's um it's basically just protection money. And this is and this is what really angers me because in theory if um if the US is selling weapons to Taiwan, it means that um the US is um shifting its um defense um what if the line of defense against um I guess containing now China, the Chinese mainland all the way out west to the other side of the Pacific instead of, you know, California, Alaska, whatever. So if you're, you're basically getting these people to be your, um, to be your watchdog, right? If you had a guard dog, assuming dogs knew how to buy things, would you make, would you make him buy his own food? Or do you, <laughs> or, or do you provide his food and his kibbles and bones for him? Cause they, it's, um, <laughs> It's it's if it's supposed to be a mutually beneficial um arrangement, okay? Then why why do people on the front line need to be paying for these outdated weapons? And the the act exactly. itself doesn't say that we will sell or we will lease. It says we will provide. So this is what also really pisses me off about the um the politicians in Taiwan is they need to grow a backbone and be like, okay, you know. We'll we'll do this, but we're not gonna we're not gonna pay for them. Either you give them to us, or you can fuck off, and we'll move closer to we'll move closer to Beijing. I mean, if you, if you're if you're in that sort of situation, that's a smart thing to do. That's that's how power struggles work. Policy and look, yeah. 
So far, we've been talking about Taiwan almost exclusively in terms of what other countries want from it. But the key question is clearly, what does it want for itself? But even that is not easy to answer. Taiwan is made up of a mix of different cultures, languages and political viewpoints. Remember, their lawmakers sometimes throw pig intestines at each other in Parliament. <laughs> Everyone is not on the same page there. <laughs> But to the extent Taiwanese people have spoken through the ballot box, they've chosen a government that wants to keep China at arm's length. That singer that you saw earlier talking about Chinese fucking Taipei, he's actually in Taiwan's parliament now. And he is <laughs> openly pro-independence. As for Taiwan's current leader, Tsai Ing-wen, she was elected on a platform of defending Taiwan, but crucially, preserving the status quo. Just watch how cautiously she discusses the question of Taiwanese independence. Are you, in principle at least, in favour of the idea of formal Taiwanese independence? The reality and what it is now is that we are already a functionally independent country. Uh, we have our own government and we have our own election. Will there come a day when that reality needs to be spelled out by a formal declaration of independence? The idea is that we don't have a need to declare ourselves an independent state, but we are an independent country. That's not what her, um, what her party's program says. You want me to pull it up? Yes, pull it up. I, um, I sent it to you um, on, um, on chat. I think you can pull it up. So um, I guess you want to translate while I read it out? Uh, no, you, you, you can just read it out and then translate okay. it. Okay. So our fundamental... Um, our, um, my English is so bad. Our, um, <laughs> what? Our, um, our, 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 our um, fundamental... Um, things we advocate fundamentally. And the first one, the first, the first little um, article thing. Uh, so establish a sovereign and independent um, republic of Taiwan. Taiwan republic. And um, yeah. it says, um, 国家领域主权和国民身份的确立是现代主权国家对内建立法政秩序对外发展国际外交的前提. So, um, ah, screw this. This is too much. Basically, it's saying, um, um, for the longest time, um, the, the KMT has um, tried to um, declare... Um, itself to be the sole legitimate government of all of China, but it only effectively controls um, Taiwan. And um, this has caused great confusion among people in, in terms of their um, identity and what they, their national identity and what they consider to be their country and um, has, has caused um, a huge um, impasse in terms of, um, in terms of, um, I guess, a constitutional um created a constitutional impasse um within Taiwan and then it's also um given the, the Chinese Communist Party um a, a, a kind of um so, uh, ambition yeah, ambition yeah 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 and so um, suffice to say suffice to say the the party platform of DT, DPP which is a party of Tsai Ing-wen the current leader of Taiwan openly calls for uh, openly declare independence to to find that it, its goal is to do that through a referendum. So I mean, either you say that, either you change your party program and say, "Hey, we're not, we're not, we're not um, doing that anymore, and we want to maintain the status quo indefinitely." But see, that would that would alienate the um the hardcore um pro the, the the hardcore separatists. Yeah, and when push comes to shove, and it always does because it's a it's a liberal democracy, it's capitalism, things are always going to mess up. That's when the rhetoric gets um gets pushed out more. That's you saw with um Chen Shui when he was caught in that embezzlement scandal and like he lost a lot of um his more lukewarm supporters. He had to turn to his uh, more um more extremist separatist supporters and really up the um separatist um rhetoric, right? Mm, yeah. Right. She's clearly declaring that they're independent there, but also very much drawing the line at a declaration of independence. Because she knows that Taiwan explicitly formalizing the way things are could cause a lot of trouble. It's like meeting your partner's parents for the first time and saying, hello, I regularly fuck your offspring. <laughs> yeah, everyone was aware of that, but now that you've officially declared it, things are gonna get much more difficult for everyone involved here.
And the truth is, that intense pragmatism is in line with how many Taiwanese people feel. Polls have consistently shown that when they are asked about independence from or unification with China, something like 1.5% want unification with China as soon as possible, and about 6% want independence as soon as possible. But the vast majority favour some version of sticking with the status quo, at least for now, which does make sense, because as things stand, as volatile as this situation can appear, day-to-day -day life in Taiwan can go on as normal as this Taiwanese man shows. He doesn't really point out how things have changed. I mean, like I said earlier in this episode, even at the turn of the century, most people's views were, yes, we want to maintain the status quo, but we eventually want to unify. But um, this also, yeah, I mean, a lot of this has to do with I how... Sorry. And also in the 90s, most of the people in Taiwan still consider themselves Chinese. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that. So, but, but, you know, that's, again, that's beyond John Oliver. And that's also not the material that John Oliver's uh, source wants to provide. Uh, you know, the, so, so this is, this is a specific narrative they're pushing here. When Chen Shui bian was elected in 2000, he changed, his government changed a lot of the textbooks in, um, in Taiwan. So before in the past, when kids went to school, even in the 90s, they had to learn about like all of this Chinese history. They had to learn about um the um the Yangtze, which province which Chinese provinces the Yangtze River goes through and like the pot which which is the biggest um freshwater lake in, in, in all of China. And um and they learn about how um Japanese colonization and all of that. But then in in the two thousands all of this changed. I mean, okay, admittedly in the past, there wasn't enough of a focus on Taiwan and that alienated people. That could have been rectified. But then the thing is, okay, we're going to um, just folk hyper-focus on Taiwan and then only barely touch. And then we're going to reduce the um, the amount of stuff that the kids learn about the Chinese mainland and, and its history. And, um, oh, at the same time, we're going to change it. So it's not, it's, not, um, it's not the occupation of Taiwan by Japan, but it's the Japanese administration of Taiwan. So it's also whitewashing that period of time. And um, of course you do that, it's going to change people's consciousness. Even in the uh, James Oliver segment, you see that they, they equate the Qin rule of Taiwan with the Japanese rule. I mean, they, they say, oh, Taiwan is just being like a trophy being passed around from different powers. So, so they're basically saying that the Qin rule over Taiwan is the same as the Dutch colonial rule, is the same as the Japanese colonial rule, which is what these separatists are pushing. People in Taiwan aren't Japanese, but the majority of the people in Taiwan have are, are, um, are Han. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, it's, I, and also John Oliver here, he just contradicted all what he said earlier. You know, if, the status quo is what the Thai, most of the Taiwanese public want, and 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 that's fine and dandy. Then why is he making all these fuss about you know uh, trying to change change the status quo, wanting WHO to admit Taiwan, wanting all these countries to recognize Taiwan, when Tsai Ing-wen herself said it's fine, <laughs> we don't need to declare formal independence. <laughs> You know, she was. She's always been a political opportunist. I mean, she didn't even join the DPP. Yeah, of and she didn't even join the DPP until until Chen Sui Bian's um, leadership. Yeah. For for a more gory details, check our Taiwan history series on Silk and Steel podcast. So, recently, the Chinese people are trying to take back Taiwan. Oh, and you just said the Chinese people are trying to take back Taiwan. Oh, and you just said the Chinese people are trying to take back Taiwan. Oh, and you just said the Chinese people are trying to take back Taiwan. 我是視而不見啊,因為本身台灣黨的是這台灣黨的代機嘛,哎 <笑> Wow, that is a pretty relaxed attitude given the circumstances here. He's talking about the nuclear armed, saber rattling superpower taunting his country with warplanes like it's season 2 of Emily in Paris. You know, I don't love that it's happening, but honestly, I just try to carry on with my life. But the question is can the currently safe status quo hold forever? Xi Jinping has stated that the question of Taiwan cannot simply be passed on from generation to generation, and those military drills do seem to be sending a message. And while experts say war is not imminent, Taiwan is understandably 
thinking about its own defense capabilities. Something, by the way, that the US has been happy to assist them in thinking about by selling them billions of dollars in weapons, showing that even strategic ambiguity has its price. <laughs> but despite US assistance, the Taiwan military is obviously a fraction of China's, and its recent attempts to att attract recruits have left something to be desired. The armed forces have been producing videos like this to try to drum up enthusiasm among potential young soldiers. But they've been struggling to make up for a shortfall left by a phasing out of conscription. Okay, I am... Oh, speaking of this, um, political power grows from the barrel of the gun, right? A lot of these young separatists today are finding ways to get out of their um, compulsory military service, which has, uh, which has been reduced to four months, by the yep. way. Including that um that uh that legislator Freddie Lim, oh really? <laughs> yeah, he got out of it. He said he said it's because of um because of um Zhao Yuzheng. Why? Zhao Yuzheng. He just um kept on visiting a psych um a what is it? a bipolar disorder. He kept on um saying that it's um because. He kept on visiting a, 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 psych, a psychiatrist and then just had a lot, bunch of like doctor's notes written and got out of military service. I mean, whether or not he really does have it, I don't know. But there's plenty of people who do have it and still do it. So it's like, I, I feel like the, the main thing is he just doesn't want to do it, which is fine. But if, if you don't want to do a military service, then who's... The I mean, that's the strategy of the most uh, separatists because they feel... You know, Taiwan cannot defend itself. It has to rely on the Americans. So why bother? So their strategy is to keep on bitch and moan and, and, and try to get the U.S. come to their defense. I've heard people say, well, it's because we're separatists. We don't like the so-called Republic of China. We want we So we don't want to be ROC soldiers. We want to become ROT soldiers. I'm like, yeah, well, if you want to declare independence and you want... um. And the PLA comes in because you start stepping on red lines, then you, who's gonna who's gonna fight them off? <laughs> or do or Americans. do or, or, or do they just know that it's a lost cause? Yeah, they want to send in the Marines, but but in reality, they probably just board the planes for 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 US. <laughs> it's gonna be a Cabo two point Wanna finish the video? Yeah. Okay, I am really not sure that that is helping. That does not look like a group of people who are excited to be in the military. It looks like a bunch of background dancers who were cut from In the Heights because they were too boring to be on camera. <laughs> so, what exactly can or should be done here? Well, that is something that the entire world has been dissecting for half a it's century like now, and so far, the answer we seem to have settled on is some version of, uh, next question, please. <laughs> which is clearly not very satisfying, and I know Ambiguity is inherently frustrating, especially for Americans who might look at a place like Taiwan, which looks and acts like a country, and feel that it is weird and farcical to not acknowledge it as one. But from a practical standpoint, no, 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 would no. That wait be a better? minute, wait a minute. What, what do you mean, as Americans, this is this feels frustrating and weird? Average Americans don't even know the difference between Taiwan and Thailand. They they only feel maybe. The thinking might be farcical because you are telling them this is farcical, and 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 this is U.S. government clearly already have a have a a, a strategy for Taiwan, which you already talk about is a strategic ambiguity. So so why why should it be weird and farcical that Taiwan is not a country? Why I mean, is it John Oliver's is, business? Why is it his viewers' business? Exactly. The, the whole issue existed because of U.S. Met, U.S. interference. I mean Truman. At, in the beginning of nineteen, in the begin, in um, in the beginning of nineteen fifty, was like you know we're just gonna be hands off with Taiwan. Chiang Kai Shek regime is done. We're gonna we're gonna let um we're gonna let the um the the Chinese civil war just kind of reach its natural conclusion. But then the um the Korean War broke out, and they're like, oh, we need to have a uh, we need we need to um we can't abandon Taiwan. And even though Chiang Kai Shek is kind of a bastard, I guess he's the right guy. So we're gonna send our seventh fleet into the Taiwan Strait. From the Philippines, even though we already acknowledge that Taiwan is a part of China and that we're not going to meddle in their uh, in their um, internal affairs, we're just going to renege on that. And even even in um in February of 1949, um U.S. diplomat um merchant was sent to um to Taiwan by the U.S. to see if an autonomous government could be set up on Taiwan. So he met with the govern with the um the provincial governor um Chen Cheng, and was like, okay, you know what, 
if you um if you separate your provincial government from from the rest of China and you cut off communication with the communists, then um the U.S. will send twenty five million annual aid, and um the Allied forces will occupy Taiwan, and a meeting with the transfer of power to the new government will take place, and then the U.S. will send its um, navy and air force to the Taiwan Strait, and then we're also going to tell Chiang Kai Shek if he wants to if he wants to go to Taiwan, then he needs to do so as a political refugee. So, I mean, you can, I mean, this plan didn't work out because Chen Cheng was loyal to Chiang Kai-shek, but you can see the U.S. was already trying to do, and was it doing it for, um, the, the out of the interest for Taiwanese people? No, it was because it, it was, it was due to its own geopolitical interests. Actually, U.S. Uh, still tried to carry out coup in Taiwan to remove Chiang Kai-shek as late as June uh, 1950. They're they're trying to they after they realize Chen Chen is not their man. They try to install a uh, another KMT general, uh, the uh, Sun Li as a, as a military leader in Taiwan to replace Jiang Kai Shek. And that and, and Atchison was supposed to deliver the official memorandum to Jiang Kai Shek himself and telling Jiang Kai Shek that he need to go in political exile. And that's only changed because of the Korean War. And the Korean War basically saved. Chiang Kai Shek's ass. And yep. Yeah. Um, I mean, Chiang Kai Shek, before the Korean War started, Chiang Kai Shek was, he already sent people to the mainland to um, to negotiate with the communists because he he knew that he was screwed. So his idea was okay, let's make it, let's work out an arrangement so that I can still have my own little like power and communists aren't going to send their boots over here. But then as soon as the Korean War started, he told his guy on the mainland, cut off all negotiations, come back to Taiwan now. Yeah. So um, say I mean, hello to the camera. My wife had to go, so he <laughs> dropped a uh, Kai Hi, Kai Xin. <laughs> Say hello to the audience, Kai Xin. <laughs> he likes to play with the mic. Uh, he he's gonna right. grow up to be a podcaster. He's gonna take over Silk and Steel when you're old. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, are we done? Are almost, we done with the video? Almost, like one minute. Better. And is that even what the people of Taiwan want? Could it be that maintaining the current deeply weird, ambiguous status quo is actually the best option here? I don't know. I'm not Taiwanese. And frankly, people who aren't Taiwanese making decisions for Taiwan is a bit fucking played out historically. <laughs> so maybe the best thing that we can do is move past talking about Taiwan like it's some kind of poker chip in a never-ending game of us versus but them. But that's what he's doing right now. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. God, yeah. Because the fact is, Taiwan is not a plucky bulwark against the Red Menace, nor is it some sort of island-sized Viagra to rejuvenate the Chinese nation. <laughs> Taiwan is 23 million people who, in the face of considerable odds, have built a free democratic society and very much deserve the right to decide their own future in any way that they deem fit, even if that means sporadically beating the absolute shit out of each other. So, um, what are your final thoughts on that episode? <laughs> I mean, I think I, I said it uh, like, the, what is the point of this Oliver James, uh, John, uh, John Oliver piece? I mean, like, at, <laughs> at, at the end, he's just saying, oh, your yeah, status quo is fine. Okay, so why are you talking about this then? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> hey, Kai Xin. <laughs> Kaishin is going to have the last word. <laughs> Can he talk yet? No, he's uh he's he's only he can't only make baby noises. Uh, uh just a little he's like 6 and a half months old now, right? Yeah, yeah, he's going to be 6 months old by the Balinese calendar on November 1st. Uh, uh because the Balinese calendar has 35 days in a month uh, It's a lunar calendar, so he will have his uh, big uh, Balinese uh, six-month ceremony on November first. Do you think he uh, right I'll, now I'll he looks? Like do you think he looks more like you or Ani right now? Uh, he. I think he when he was born he looks very much like Ani. Um, but Ani is, is saying he he is starting to look more and more like me because uh, they say his uh. They say his because his eyes is not growing. <laughs> his his face is growing, but his eyes not growing. <laughs> he has big eyes. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's he has he has. I think he has big eyes. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Kashi. Say hi to the audience. <laughs> 
Hi, Seen. Do you like John Oliver? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so yeah, this this I I don't know. Like a, a lot of people are. I I don't even get all this. What's all this excitement about this John John Oliver segment? It, it's a lot of lot of. He said a lot of words for, for nothing. Like I think it's just people like um Taiwanese Americans, especially. I mean, Taiwanese people don't watch like American TV in general. I mean, they'll watch like Netflix, but not these sorts of in general. T- most most don't watch these sorts of shows. So I think it's like Taiwanese American liberals who just want to feel like they they want to feel represented. They're the type of people who are um obsessed with let's say like Asian representation in Hollywood. And they they're like, see, see, like we have one guy telling you guys we're the good we're the good guys. We're not the we're not the bad ones. We're not the we're not the um the the CCP. I think that's at the end of the day, that's the that that's the um purpose it serves. And also just people who don't really know much about Taiwan who feel that who feel the need to comment on it, they they'll use this as like a reason to do so. I mean like the um the Twitter the, the Twitter thing I saw from that one person saying talking about how oh it's it's slammed back until until it's China and like the people on you know it's like the, the land on Taiwan already belongs to Taiwanese people. Like what land back what? <laughs> I mean I mean what I don't know what, what he's talking about. Oh Chinese colonization. Is he saying like the you know I mean I mean PRC right now is not is not responsible for whatever is going on on Taiwan right now. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Uh, I think we, that's a good hour and a half. Uh, mm-hmm. That went a little bit longer than I expected, but but it's. I think we got pretty good, solid information. And but for more detailed Taiwan history, I, I refer people back to our Taiwan history series uh, on Silk and Steel podcast, where we 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 talk about. We break this. We really break it down. So yeah, be sure to um click what click like, leave a comment, yes. subscribe. Yes. Uh, let 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 us know what you what kind of content you guys like to see next. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you guys. Thank you for watching with us for another reaction video. Um, until next time. Bye bye.